So, good afternoon. Today's class is all about postmodernism. So, what do you understand by postmodernism? Let us have your this, you know, your definitions to start with. Postmodernism probably, you know, we are talking about uh, what post-structuralism did to structuralism in philosophy. It is, you know, when we come to fiction, it is probably the same movement. So, I probably understand that the notion of centrality and wholeness that we had associated with probably structuralism and modernism to a great extent was challenged. Structuralism and? Modernism. Modernism, okay. All mm -hmm. those avant-garde movements and stuff. So, this yeah. is practically challenging all notions of centrality and wholeness. Is that it? Okay. So, challenging first definition or interpretation of postmodernism that we get is challenging the notion of centrality. See, what comes to your mind or rather who comes to your mind when you talk about people who have challenged the centrality in the, the notion of centrality in literature or in popular culture. Okay. Umberto Eco. Okay. So, um, and these are writers, filmmakers, because postmodernism has influenced popular culture and cinema as well. So, who are those filmmakers who come to your mind? French New Wave. French New Wave. Okay. If you films like uh, the last tango in Paris. Last tango in Paris. Okay. What else? Who else? Okay. You are talking about uh, movements. You are talking about a film. If I ask you to name some directors. Um, uh, uh, the one who made Pulp Fiction. Pulp Fiction, yeah. Tarantino. Tarantino, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, fine, you know, Tarantino is quite recent. So, uh, but yeah, it's one of the key names associated with the postmodernist movement, at least in cinema. Okay, so postmodernism, as Vimal was talking about, is uh, when we begin with literature. So, it is a mode of narrative which challenged the established notions of centrality as Vimal was saying and also of realism. Now, realism does not mean that uh, if it challenges realism, then postmodernism is unreal, nothing like that. What, what do you understand by realism? Who are the realists and how can the, how are, how are the realists challenged? The realism of the narrative. Okay. True to life, yeah, good. So, realism is, now if you come to postmodernism and realism. So, realism is, uh, you know, very similitude, yeah, yeah, trueness to life, hmm? uh, slice of life, this is a very cliched term, but slice of life, okay. Now, what is this slice, so called slice of life? It is very true to what we see or what we read. Uh, can you name some realists? Italian neo neorealism period. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Italian neorealist. But if I ask you the, uh, to Desica. name some. Yeah, Vittorio De Sica, mm -hmm. um, Bertolucci. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but if we look at literature, because postmodernism starts with literature. Hmm. Thomas Hardy. Thomas uh, Hardy. Okay. Yeah. Dickens is the most important name when it comes to realism. Now, what happens in a realist novel? They give you a slice of life trying to be as close to reality as possible. Okay. Uh, the idea is to uh, present, you know, show, uh, hold up mirror to society. Yeah. But, uh, and also an important feature is that there is a definite, and this word you should know, closure. there is a solution, you know, there is a plot development, there is a plot, okay, it develops, there are character sketches, well developed characters, are they not? Mm -hmm. Yes, and then at the end there is a satisfactory closure, okay. So, that is the uh, linchpin of realism, 
that it provides a satisfactory closure. A reader is not left wondering at what happened. However, if you think that this is life, my question is, is it really? Yeah, does life has a closure? Yeah, it does not. Okay. That is what postmodernists challenge, this you know, this uh, entity called a satisfactory closure. Okay. Also, now if you look at Charles Dickens, uh, think of a novel by Charles Dickens, Oliver Twist, Hard Times, um, uh, David Copperfield. Hmm. Now, what, what happens there? You, who is the narrator in David Copperfield? Whose point of view is there in, in David Copperfield? David Copperfield's. Yes. In Oliver Twist, it is Oliver Twist. Okay. In Hard Times, is the central protagonist, whoever that is. Okay. So, the entire narrative unravels through their point of view. So, narrative thus becomes, and this is another word that you should know, monologic. Now, what is monologic? Mono? Yeah, logic. Just a narrative's point of view. Yes. Yeah. What is logic? Logo is word. Okay. Mono is single. So, one single word, that is one point of view. However, this is what has been challenged by the so called postmodernists, where the narrative becomes dialogic, heteroglossic, polyphonic. We can take down these words. Actually, these terms are given by uh, the Russian formalist uh, Mikhail Bakhtin. Yes. So, narrative is supposed, supposed to be or should be ideally dialogic, that is there should be uh, interaction, okay, not just monologic, not just one point of view, one fixed point of narrative. Heteroglossic, many tongues, glossia, tongue, yeah, hetero, several. So, many tongues, it is important, you know, think of a modern movie like a Babel for example. Yeah. So, what happens in Babel? Yeah, multiple narratives. Multiple narratives, mm -hmm. multiple points of view. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Traffic and uh, Yes, mm -hmm. yeah. And polyphonic, many sounds. So, this is what postmodernism is all about, as opposed to a single monologic closure. So, what they believe in? Is the postmodernists believe in that realism, the so called realism is basically unreliable, because there cannot be, there should not be uh, 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 a single monologic closure, because life itself does not allow or does not make space for that kind of uh, you know, satisfactory or satisfying closure. Okay. So, therefore, most postmodernist texts whether you take cinema or uh, literature, they are open ended, open to several interpretations. So, relationship between postmodernist ideas and literature and art has related in challenging the conventions of realism and another interesting word that we all know, mimesis. Mimesis is imitation, imitation of life. Okay, so, there cannot be any imitation of life, because that itself becomes monologic. Anything that claims to be realist is uh, 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 a postmodernist would regard that with suspicion. Hmm? So, postmodernists doubt on the truthfully description, descriptive relationship of language to the world. Yeah. So, word itself, you know. In the beginning, there was word, <laughs> okay. but no, postmodernism does not believe in that. So, there should not be any exegesis of the text. It is not one fixed text, which is which can go unchallenged. So, word, okay, word itself, language itself becomes suspect, language, word. So, that, that, that uh, hegemony of language, hegemony of the written 
text goes, um, if it is unchallenged, then postmodernists seek to challenge it. Okay. And one of the most, ex, uh, 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 one of the earliest examples of this challenge was the French novel Roma, not uh, Nouvelle Vague as the French New Wave, that is cinema. Nouvelle Roma, Roma is novel of course, okay. so new novel. Now, if you think of modernism and because what is post modernism, post hyphen modernism, that means something which came after modernism. So, if we look at modernism, this entity called modernism, what is modernism? What, what did modernism entail? It brought in uh, technology changes in lifestyle. Ch changes in lifestyle? Yeah, changes in yeah. the way we represent fiction maybe, avant-garde movements and stuff like that. Okay. In fiction, you had all these, right, avant-garde movements, pop culture, technology, all these signify modernism. Now, there is a lot of vagueness about uh, um, the commencement of this uh, phenomenon of modernism. We can never be very sure, when did this uh, movement called modernism begin, when exactly. Okay. In fiction, many people say Henry James's novels, uh, uh, you know Henry James is one of the most important precursors of modernism. Well, but the uh, most important names of course, are James Joyce. And I am going to ask you what you know about these people. Franz Kafka, Kafka, no, I think that is Nietzsche. Kafka, who wrote um, yes. The castle, something like Yes, the castle, castle. metamorphosis. Metamorphosis, yeah. Yeah. And uh, um, give me more names. Mm, Modernism. Uh, Eliot. Okay, good. T. S. Eliot. Marcel Proulx. Oh, yeah. Remembrance yeah, of yeah. things past. Right. Thomas Mann. Mm -hmm. James Joyce, Franz Kafka, T. S. Eliot, Marcel Proulx, Thomas Mann, all Europeans, all Europeans, okay, not a single uh, American. Yeah, American here. Mm -hmm. So, modernism as a movement, uh, at least in its initial stages, was centered in Europe. Mm -hmm. Any female, any feminine name that you can remember? Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf. Yes. Now, what is common uh, to these people? What is what is uh, one single theme that connects all these writers? Exactly. Good. They were path breaking for their time. Yes. So, a stream of conscious also uh, challenged the established notion of narrow realism. Yes. Okay. Marcel Proulx, James Joyce, of course, you know Ulysses, yeah, the seminal text by Ul uh, James Joyce, Ulysses. Kafka, of course, we have already seen. Metamorphosis. What is metamorphosis all about? It's about the change. I mean, it's about uh, yes. It, it metamorphosis uh, means change. Yeah. But what happens in the novel? It's like a nightmare metamorphosis. Yes. A man wakes up one fine morning and finds himself to be a bug. To be a bug. Okay. 
can it happen? Can it really happen? So, what is what is the metaphor here? Yeah, the paranoia of the, modern times. Yeah, the fear, yeah, the angst, the dread, the so-called dread. So, we are talking about existentialist influences on this uh, uh, so-called movement of modernism. Okay. So, one thing that is common among the protagonists of all these uh, writers is the theme of alienation, the alienated angst ridden hero, the hero who feels no connection with uh, those around him, with his society. Except uh, uh, in Virginia Woolf, all male writers and um, invariably all their protagonists are males as well. So, the alienated white male. And this was a, a quite an avant-garde movement, very revolutionary movement. Now, um, uh, this sought, all the heroes here sought to challenge the established conventions of society, social conventions. Okay. Whereas, in postmodernism, uh, it the art seems to capitulate to the dominant culture, it accepts it. I will read you a quote from Linda Hutchin, who is another key theorist of uh, postmodernism. You can take it down. A postmodernism manifests itself in many fields of cultural endeavor, architecture, literature, photography, film, painting, video, dance, music and elsewhere. In general terms, it takes the form of and these are the keywords self conscious, self contradictory, and self undermining statement. self conscious, self contradictory, self undermining statement. Since you mentioned Umberto Eco's and his famous novel, Name of the Rose. Okay, so, I am going to read you one paragraph from the name of the rose by Umberto Eco. Um, think of the postmodernist attitude here, okay, just listen to this paragraph carefully. So, he says, I think of the postmodern attitude and he writes as that, so postmodernist attitude is compared to a man who loves a very cultivated woman, a man who loves a very cultivated woman and knows he ca cannot say to her, I love you madly. You cannot say that to a very cultured woman, I love you madly, because he knows that she knows and that she knows that he knows that these words have already been written by Barbara Cartland. Now, who is Barbara Cartland? Uh, someone, you know, uh, thoroughly uh, commercial kind of a romantic novelist. Hmm? Like uh, we have now Mills and Boone, yeah. So, a generation before Mills and Boone, we had Barbara Cartland, where you would have dashing heroes and uh, demure, beautiful girls, and they would fall in love invariably. And this is how the man would express his love, okay. I love you madly. But when you say that to a postmodern <laughs> contemporary woman, I love you madly, you know, she will just think of those Barbara Cartland novels and she will say, Okay, this is just a lift from a novel. Okay, so he is not saying anything uh, new to me. So then, uh, Eco goes on. Still, there is a solution. 
he can say as Barbara Cartland would put it, I love you madly. So, that is the way I love you as Barbara Cartland would put it. So, now what is self consciousness, okay, self referential. So, there is a consciousness, yeah, that it is, so, yeah. So, you are taking it, taking elements from several uh, different aspects of popular culture. Barbara uh, Cartland is not high broker, high bro or high culture, okay, that is the difference. So, you take a postmodern work of art would borrow elements from uh, high bro as well as very popular or the so called low bro elements of culture. I will go on because since it is a uh, very uh, interesting paragraph, so I could not resist. At this point, having avoided false innocence, having said clearly that it is no longer possible to speak innocently, he will nevertheless have said what he wanted to say to the woman that he loves her, but he loves her in an age of lost innocence. In an age of innocence, you can say that to a woman that I love you madly. In an age of lost innocence, you say I love you the way a Barbara Cartland hero would love his woman. Okay. If the woman goes along with this, she will have received a declaration of love all the same. Uh, neither of the two speakers will feel innocent. Both will have accepted the challenge of the past of the already said. So, they you know they go into the relationship or they play this love game totally self conscious, okay. They come into it. Yes, yes, and this is not the first time a man has said these words to a woman. They has accepted and agreed. Agreed, okay. So, it has been done several times uh, in better ways. Uh, so, um, both will have accepted the challenge of the past of the already said, which cannot be eliminated. Both will consciously and with pleasure play the game of irony. So, then postmodernism also accepts the implicit irony in it, okay, the implicit self contradictions, okay, self awareness, self con consciousness, okay, that is an integral part of any postmodernist work of uh, any postmodernist text, Pulp Fiction you said, yes and why is it postmodernist? You say postmodern uh, Pulp Fiction is a good example of postmodernism, Quentin Tarantino directed Pulp Fiction and you accept him as a, a key director of the postmodern uh, cinema. Okay, so, why do you say post Pulp Fiction is a good example of postmodernism? On the naivety of realism. Okay. Every statement that is made is probably an intelligent statement that attempts to redo all cliches. So. Okay. Now, uh, uh, have you seen post uh, Pulp Fiction? Do you I remember? I don't. Have Do you? Yeah, I've seen it, but you know. Okay. Yeah, okay. I remember certain scenes. Let's you know, talk about the scene. I, I'm sure, very sure that um, you will remember mm, uh, the scene where John Travolta takes uh, Uma Thurman uh, to a dance club. Okay. Do you remember that? Uh, Uma Thurman happens to be the wife uh, of a mafia boss. Uh, John Travolta works for that yeah, boss. Right, right, right. Yeah, and he has been ordered that you take my, you keep my wife entertained while I am away. Now the wife Uma Thurman, who is a typical palm fatal, she wants to be entertained and she orders John Travolta to take him uh, to take her to a, a dance kambar. Okay, and he does so because he wouldn't dare to. Uh, yeah, he upset her in any way. Okay. Now, they go there and uh, there is a dance competition being held and she wants to participate in that competition and she wants to win that trophy. Okay. It does not mean much to her, but still uh, well, you know, it gives her some kind of a kick. So, she wants it. She persuades John Travolta to um, you know become her partner and she says, I know you are a better dancer and I want you to win that trophy for me. We have to win that. Okay. Now, <coughs> Tarantino being a postmodernist is quoting directly from where? Which source? Are we talking about an uh, older movie? Yes, the therefore same? you quote, right? Right. Something so which, uh, which has already been there. 
like a Barbara Cartland text, a pre-existing text, Saturday Night Fever. Again, uh, blockbuster starring John Travolta. So, the movie uh, capitalizes on the viewer's knowledge, on the audience's knowledge that they know that this, this actor is a fabulous dancer. And there was a similar scene in Saturday Night Fever, where he participates in a dance competition and wins the trophy. Okay, so, that you know, so they, uh, they depend, the uh, postmodernist writers or uh, the authors, okay, they, they depend uh, on the success of their products upon the knowledge, the pre-existing knowledge of their readers and their audience. But if you are not aware of it, much would be lost to you. Am I right? But yeah. then, uh, would you call all the spoofs that come out of major movies? The spoof is not. So, the element of intertextuality plays a very important Extremely, yeah. That is a, that's a very good word, intertextuality. Intertextuality, since Vidya has mentioned it. So, let me tell you a bit about it. Now, intertextuality is an integral part of postmodernism. Okay. It is a term coined by Julia Kristeva. Where she talks about how um, much of a, a pleasure uh, of a text depends on uh, uh, the reader's ability or the uh, or the audience's ability to uh, find a, a previous uh, you know a, a connection with you know with other text yes yeah to to a prior or to a pre-existing text. No, it, it need not be, it need not be. They can quote either from a work of um, uh, literature okay, or literature can co quote something from film. So, it need not be from the same medium. Okay, because after all, that is postmodernism. Okay. So, postmodernism does not differentiate between high and low. And about the for instance, movies and stuff. Whose movie? God of Small Things, this is re yes, repeated reference God to the particular things. movie. Yeah. yeah, yes. The particular Malayala movie, Chemin. Ah, yes. It runs yes. like a motif. God of Small Things make references to um, a Malayala movie, Chemin, which is, you know, of course, all of us are aware of that. Salman Rushdie's text, yeah, frequent references to um, popular culture, okay, popular film stars, Hindi cinema. Okay. For example, I am just reminded of Shalima the Clown. Okay, you have one uh, character in Shalima the Clown, uh, Salman Rushdie's 2006 or 7 novel, uh, uh, where the central actor, uh, so one of the key character is called Max Offils. Does it, does the name ring a bell? Max Offils. Okay, in he happens to be uh, a diplomat and you know an ambassador uh, to India. He comes from some foreign land. I can't remember exactly from where he comes. But Max Offels is a real life film director. Yeah, he is uh, the author. He is considered one of the key authors of uh, uh, the 50s and 60s. Yeah, he has made films like uh, Lola Montes and uh, um, the earrings of Madame the ellipses. Okay. So, he, he was also considered one of the key author, authors of modernism and postmodernism, you know, the transition between that make a filmmaker of that transition period. And then Salman Rajdi quotes him, makes direct reference to him. But if we are not aware of this, we lose the, you know, uh, the irony, the word play, the paradoxes implicit. Okay. Uh, I would also like to draw your attention to this writer and I am sure you are aware of Lyotard, the post modern condition, a 1979 text. 
Jean Francois Lyotard, the postmodern condition. Now, um, he says a lot, he is not exactly uh, talking about postmodern fiction, okay, but you need to know who Jean uh, Francois Loyotard was and uh, there is a key text like postmodern condition. Okay, so, because he, uh, this he basically discusses uh, the cities, the postmodern cities, uh, cultural spaces, the architecture of a city okay, and gives a postmodern spin to that. Okay. He also says, um, he also gives us uh, the notion of meta narrative. Now, I, I would like to caution you here, kindly do not confuse it with meta fiction. Meta fiction is different, meta theater is different, meta narrative is different. Meta narrative is a story which individuals and societies tell in order to situate their particular time and place within the context of larger story. Meta narrative in other words is a device for framing cultures, it has got nothing to do with a narrative, a work of, a work of art or text, it is a device. Okay. So, according to Lyotard, who are those you know uh, uh, people of who indulge in these meta narratives you know meta narratives is grand stories about a story a culture okay um, also uh, an attempt is made to universalize those ideas marxism called marxism good yeah. yeah marxism is a very good example of meta narrative okay where uh, it is not uh, considered to be situated in one specific cultural context, workers of the world unite. Okay. So, you give a universal spin to something, uh, to, to an ideology. Yeah. So, you, it becomes meta narrative, framing an entire culture and making it universal. Postmodernism, however, uh, according to Lyotard, postmodernists should attempt to write petty racies. Petit, of course, is a French word for small, receipt, stories, yeah, not grand narratives, but meta narratives. So, Marxism, yes, yeah. So, he makes a, a, a proposal for petty receipt and not meta narratives. So, uh, works of Marx are grand narratives or meta narratives, works of um, eminent sociologists like uh, Max Weber, they are, or any scientific discoveries, writings, Charles Darwin, they become meta narratives. They try to frame uh, a culture universal. universal, yeah. So, postmodernist, uh, postmodern social theorists call for a return to the local and reject the grand theories Now, coming to the postmodern novel, so some of the classics of postmodernist fiction are, I um, will give you some examples just often, John Bart, B A R T H, then George Bore, B O R G E S, Then you have people like William Burrow, The Naked Lunch. Carlos Fiontes, 
Thomas Pynchon, Don DeLillo. Milan Kundera, the unbearable lightness of being. Michael Ondate, the English patient. Now, give yourselves a moment, think of uh, all these writers and tell me uh, if they are considered to be the key authors of a postmodernist novel, then what is so common in their writing? Look at your uh, notes, okay, your notes that you have been meeting or, uh, making all these, all this time. So, uh, what is so common in the writings of these work, novelists? Okay, Exp yeah, yeah. So, um, exploration of sexuality. Okay, what else? What sexuality could that be, Vidya? Hetero? Yeah. Deviant sexuality. Deviant, Deviant as well. Sexuality. Yeah. So it's not just heterosexual. Not the regular. Uh, yes. Believed. Uh, yes. Go on. Uh, existing a knowledge of uh, sexuality or uh, society's uh, uh, norm. Yes, yeah, anything but hetero heteronormative. Yes, okay. so challenges the established conventions of society for one okay, and acceptance of plurality, yeah, multiplicity and that is something which is implicit in all these texts and they are not even told from one singular point of view. Yeah, You have a text for example, The Remains of the Day by uh, Kazuo Ishiguro, okay, who is a Japanese settled in Britain. Um, the no novel is told entirely from his point of view. However, at the end we are told that this narrator is an unreliable narrator. Okay, you cannot. Yes. Great Indian novel. Yes. Yeah, that is a good example. Mm. The unreliable narrator. Yes. So, Linda Hutchin, Brian McHale, um, of course, Frederick Jameson, what is that? That is Kermode, yes, Frank Kermode. Is it or is it a uh, is it a critical work? Yeah, I am looking at now the uh, eminent critics of uh, or theoreticians of uh, uh, the postmodernist movement. So Brian McHale, the postmodernist fiction, the postmodern fiction. Then you have uh, Frederick Jameson. Then you have uh, Baudrillard. Yeah. Jean Baudrillard, Linda Hutchin, and as it, as it happens in most uh, uh, theoretical works, uh, most of them contradict each other. So you should not get unnerved by what they say, yeah, there is a contradiction, there is, they all seek to, you know, complement as well as contradict each other. Oh yeah, another very important name is Ihab Hassan. So, we are talking about the major theoreticians of uh, postmodernism. So, all these writers are concerned with uh, images in circulation in culture, texts as well as images in circulation in a particular culture and how can one reuse or reinterpret or recode okay, or interrogate those images. 
Okay. That is implicit in the works of all these theoreticians. So, now how uh, coming back to my first question, how does postmodernism differ from modernism? Uh, like monologic and uh, dialogic, uh, yes. that, that one uh, element is there. And then re realism is questioned uh, in postmodernism. Then uh, imitation is not allowed. Absolutely, yeah, good. Happens. However, uh, the modernist hero, the alienated hero, the angst-ridden hero, okay, you no longer have such heroic heroes anymore. Yeah, so postmod. Absolutely, yeah. So, we had losers even in the modernist yeah. culture. Losers were not glorified in grand narratives. Yes, yes, yeah, but uh, in postmodernism, those losers are not glorified. Okay. You do not get to know much about them, okay. they become smaller and smaller. So, uh, um, while the modernist artist, the modernist hero, the grand hero, the heroic hero was, uh, would work out of pure imagination, stream of consciousness techniques. The postmodern artist works with the cultural givens. Okay, so he uses the excesses, the social mores, the cultural excesses, the cultural mores of the society, and try to become whole. Okay, so his his uh, uh, persona uh, is uh, uh, influenced by several external influences, the cultural influences, and these cultural elements could be high as well as low. Okay. So, therefore, we have the notion of and the this these are another very relevant terms for you. So, the postmodern hero, if you can call him or her a hero, he is made up of yes, parody, pastiche, collage. Ambiguities, yes, and juxtaposition. So that's that takes care of your ambiguity. Paradoxes. Can you name uh, uh, an artist, a postmodern artist, who uh, who is noted for his use of collage? Artist, not an actor. Artist, okay. Known for his very popular collages. Yeah. Yes. The, the one who drew Guernica. That's Picasso, that Picasso? is a modernist. Yeah, it's a modernist. Yes, Picasso is not most modern. Dali? Salvador Dali? That is surrealism. Yeah, that is an offshoot of modernism. Are you familiar with this name, Andy Warhol? Sir, yes. Okay, I would like you to know more about Andy Warhol because he is a, a very significant name of uh, uh, you know associated with collage, the postmodernist collage. You may perhaps recall uh, you know images of. Uh, Marilyn Monroe in all colors, you know, those the close-ups of her face, yeah, in all, in colors, and also the he did some work with a, a can of beans, you know, he made a can of beans and he did some work on it, so beautiful collages on that. So finding art in commonplace objects, that's the idea. I think this is still important, so I will let it be here, parody, pastiche.
Frederick Jameson is very fond of using this word pastish. Okay, he says all uh, modern art is a pastish. Okay, influences and you know, cultural external influences. Parody is not the way we understand it uh, commonly. Okay, yes, yes. It's not uh, that humorous or satirical. Uh, something that is used to evoke laughter, that is not. And this is a word Linda Hutchin uses. So, this is Linda Hutchin, this is Frederick Jameson. So, Linda Hutchin proposes uh, that uh, it, the, the, the work of art makes use of parody and for Jameson, it is pastish. And uh, uh, Jameson regards parody as the way it is uh, usually regarded, as it is full of you know low laughter, yes, uh, ridicule or satire. But for Linda Hutchin, pa his pastish is empty and hollow. Okay. We'll look at it um, in detail later. Now, some of the characteristic of any postmodernist text, literature or fiction or novel or even cinema, one is uh, undecidability. This suggests the impossibility of deciding between two interpretations. Yes, between good and bad also. No polarities. No, no, polarities, no uh, you know, uh, distinctly marked categories. Okay. Kamal Hassan's films as well. Okay, can you give me an example? Andre Siram, for instance. Uh, Madhavan's character, mm -hmm. uh, one of those confused characters does not know the difference between a good and bad guy. Mm -hmm. He thinks uh, the physically you know, uh, dis uh, uh, dislocated Kamal Hassan to be a terrorist in the beginning. Yes. And then finally, you know, he calls him his brother and that kind of a thing. So, there is a change in him and with respect to believing whether he is a good or a bad guy. Uh -huh. Throughout the film, there is a confusion. Okay. So he At the end, is it resolved? At the end, it is. Yes, but then but there is a closure. But there is a closure, yeah. You probably. see? So, a postmodernism decides against closure. Yeah. So, undecidability, of course, that uh, inability, to de inability to decide between multiplicity so of. Element of postmodernism. Yeah. But uh, the there is closure. So, does not fit into both, is it? Then, uh, Perhaps you know we will have to watch it again, okay. yeah, to understand which category it fits in. Okay. Okay. All right. Then uh, apocryphal history. This is another feature of a postmodernist text. Which apocryphal? I'll write it. Undecidability. Well, you know, um, a historical work okay, or history itself is challenged. Okay. Perhaps something is added, something is deleted from the uh, uh, extremely normative prescri prescriptive text, historical text. Something is added, something is interrogated, something is challenged. So, revisiting history and reinterpreting it, that is apocryphal history, that is one of the, could be could be. Uh, yeah, Hiram actually falls in the category of a historiography, okay, writing the history again. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, so you, you can look at apocryphal history. Yeah. Yes. For Pepper and Christ. Yes, suppose. And then, you also have the science fiction framework, gravity's rainbow. Thomas Pynchon, Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which was remade as a very key postmodern text called uh, Blade Runner. Okay, Blade Runner is one of the best sci-fi film. Okay, is based on a 
science fiction novel. So, by creating the idea is to create new truths and not just accept the already established truths. The science fiction also interrogates the prevailing, the prevailing truths, matrix series for example. Okay. It does not accept whatever we have been told, cloning, yeah, having uh, androids all around, okay. that is one example of science fiction. Then uh, Brian McHale also talks about the Chinese box, box structure of the narrative. Chinese box structure. Now, a Chinese box uh, traditionally um, does not have a regular borders okay, or a structure, it has skewed and distortions. Okay. The edges are skewed and distorted. Okay. So, that kind of interpretation, okay. we have, so there cannot be, again we are going back to the um, undecidable narrative subject to ambiguities, abrupt shifts. Can we say that it must also lead to multiple interpretations? Absolutely, definitely. Also, postmodern texts often subverts the established notions of uh, space and time. Yeah. All the rational categories are yeah, subverted and interrogated. Features of modernism, right? Yes. Rationality, reason. Rationality and postmodernism is a challenge to that rationality. Meso beam. Meso beam. A B Y M E. This involves the paradoxical representation of within the fictional world of a fictional world. So, it is like looking in a mirror yeah, and seeing the reflection. I will give you an example. I am looking at Italo Calvino's If on a Winter's Night a Traveler. Now, look at the title it, itself. Does it give you anything? If on a winter's night, a traveler, yeah. yeah, it doesn't even make sense. Okay, so undecidability, okay, uh, subject to many interpretations, no closure. Okay, it's a sentence itself. You cannot have a sentence with a conditional and then just leave it halfway. So syntax, is syntax is distorted. So challenging the established notions of language itself. Okay. And now, um, I was saying that meso uh, beam occurs when a text, when there is a, in a text, when there is a reduplication of images or concepts referring to the textual whole. So, film within film, film is a good example of a meso beam, okay. and then uh, fiction within fiction. Now, look at this example if on a winter's night a traveler, this is how it begins. I am reading it out to you. You are about to begin reading Italo Calvino's new novel, If on a Winter's Night a Travel. Relax, concentrate, dispel every other thought. Let the world around you fade. Best to close the door. The TV is always on in the next room. Tell the others right away, no, I do not want to watch TV. Raise your voice, they will not hear you otherwise. I am reading, I do not want to be disturbed. Maybe they have not heard you with all that racket. Speak louder, yell. I am beginning to read Italo Calvino's new novel or if you prefer, do not say anything. Just hope they leave you alone. Okay. So, referring to oneself. Can you think of a movie like this? Movie within movie structure. Actually, there was this movie in Malayalam. Okay, good. Uh, that was uh, it's a movie of Mohanlal, but that's not really postmodern. But it had a. It was remade in Tamil uh, as well. Very thick. Tamil remake. It's that uh, Kadapare involved, not Kadapare involved. Um, oh yeah, even that too, right? Yeah, even that had a. Yeah, even that had a. Yeah, but that's like just for you know, that still had a very linear narrative. So yeah. 
but it still had a movie you know working inside the movie so there is another malayala movie where there's a writer writing a novel yeah, yeah. exactly ayal kadhe eludhi gyana so okay. there is you know reference to right so the process of writing is interpreted is challenged or you know reflected on perhaps hmm? so this is a very good example so uh, post modern fiction i mean in cinema as ex- uh, especially in western cinema you will find several such examples movie within movie okay any number of uh, funny games oh yeah funny games say very much yes with that it can be said oh it's a biopic kind of a thing there are uh, elements of films being made uh, but not self referential see here he is totally self referential yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. friendship yeah it still had a very linear narrative yeah you know uh, a good example could be 8 uh, and 1/2 8 and 1/2 by felini okay where felini himself was uh, going through a midlife crisis um, and he had a director's block yeah he couldn't make so he didn't know what plot he is going to handle next and that's what the new movie is about a film director who is at a loss who is stuck half way right? yes uh something bergman's a very recent movie mm-hmm. bergman i think he was that's a that's based on his life uh, okay i would like to give examples of uh, funny games where uh, there is a couple along with their child and they are holidaying in their country house um two seemingly uh, harmless young men they knock at the door and they ask for eggs and the housewife just uh, thinking that you know just you know we have to be good neighbors she doesn't know them she lets them enter and once they enter all hell break loose they uh, uh, shoot the husband uh, he he is somewhat you know just left somewhere uh, wounded and uh, they do bad things to his wife they kill the child okay all for pleasure, pleasure. okay now what happens at one point the woman says i can't take it any can't take this anymore she takes she finds a gun somewhere and she shoots one of the guys now uh, the friend says okay how did you kill my um, friend this is not uh, the way it is uh, supposed to happen and now he rewinds takes a you know a remote control and he says i'm going to rewind the entire scene now and then the uh, the dead guy he comes back to life okay self referential he is actually commenting on the kind of uh, media we are saturated you know we are infused with the kind of violence we are uh, uh, we see on the media around us okay escapes and he goes meets his wife etc and then finally all these things are his imagination and finally he is uh, hung uh, so the, the movie that we see yeah. is only his imagination So okay. he's still there at the gallows when we come back again. Yes. And then finally he is killed him. Okay. All right. So we will also look at the um, use of or uh, pastish as a category of postmodernism. And pa- uh, again we go back to Umberto Eco's uh, uh, the, the name of the rose. So what is the name of the rose here? Wh- what is it? Do you have any idea about the novel? I uh, haven't to see the movie. Yeah. It was made on the novel and I had read something on it but Yeah the entire story unfolds in a medieval monastery. Yeah. And then there is a murder of a monk. And then another monk is called to solve the mystery. So it's extremely you know like uh, Sherlock Holmes a detective story. But detective stories which quotes alludes to Aristotle to scientific theories to uh, political theories and uh, even to the popular cultural theories okay a novel which is written during the 80s so it re- alludes to it refers to um high as well as low culture okay and it becomes a pastiche but it's not a comedy it's a serious work of art it's a detective story it's a murder story but Umberto Eco very cleverly borrows from all elements you know all the elements which Uh, all the uh, cultural elements the popular cultural elements which influences okay. so it is a, it is a detective genre it's medieval history it's a gothic okay and it's also a treatise on uh, science 
technology, um, politics. Okay. So, hybridity is the key word here, past-ish hybridity. Then Bakhtin also uses a, an interesting word called carnival. Yes. And carnival was the time, uh, uh, it is used because uh, that was a period when official life comes uh, to a temporary halt okay? and uh, there is an inversion of high and low. So, this provides for a subversion, yeah. so this provides for a subversion of sensibility and interrogation of authority. Another example is uh, or another feature of uh, a postmodern novels is the is a is a concept Ritur the personages. And Ellen Rob Grillet is the key author, the French author. The term retour the personage is return of the characters. So, the same characters you are talking about intertextuality, right. Okay, so, so, this is another good example of um, intertextuality. Characters from one novel find their way into another. Yes, yeah, characters shift, you know, move from one novel to another, from one, from one film to another. Yeah, it is also a very postmodernist feature. Okay. However, they may not, they may, they may not retain their characteristics. So they may be something, someone uh, totally different in one film or in one novel, and they may change their colors in another. Yeah. Like to say that yeah. uh, Rajinikanth movie Baba. Okay. In that, um, the Nilambri ca character of his previous film Padayappa, hmm. as Nilambri goes. And the, 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 his friends will say, hey, Nilambri, Padepa Nilambri is going there. Is it so? Yeah. Ah. So, and he says, you know, he has this power to, you know, if he thinks it will happen. Okay. So, he, she will come and ask uh, me for the time. Okay. So, this is <laughs> later side. Interesting. Okay. So, <coughs> um, a very interesting example of um, postmodern novel is The French Lieutenant's Woman by John Fowles, 1969 novel which is set in the Victorian era. So, the hero is a Darwinian and very interestingly his name is also Charles, not, Char not Charles Darwin, but he is, he is a believer in the theories and the scientific theories of Charles Darwin. He has a fiancé, a very uh, well brought up British, proper British lady and there is a mysterious young woman in his life. Okay. Now, uh, it is a love triangle and it is set in Victorian period, but at the same time you have a film production which is making a film set in Victorian era. So, you know the narrative, the alternates between the two periods, Victorian period thereby making uh, a pastiche, a parody of the Victorian era. So, there is a movie uh, you know production going on, a movie shoot going on, okay. they are making a film in on Victorian morals, on Victorian settings and all. At the same time, you have this other story going on, which is actually based in the Victorian era. Okay. So, while doing so, they take elements from the vic typical uh, Victorian uh, novels and comments on the Victorian prudery, um, uh, you know, the morals, the hypocrisies of the time. So, again, 
it is a good example of self consciousness, self reflexivity and relativism. And it is uh, the novel is also noted for using uh, um, three different endings. If you remember, there are three different endings to the French lieutenant's woman. The narrator says, okay, so you do not like this dear reader, let us give you this, let us have this. So, you are given a choice of three separate endings. Does it have three different? Does it have, but the story is uh, runs in two parallels. What if in case she's caught the train and gone? Okay, and what if, if she? Yes, quite. Uh, yeah, yes. So yeah, so um, uh, Girish Karnad in Nagamandala gives us three uh, alternative endings. Okay, uh, it's a story about a woman who takes a lover, uh, you know, the serpent lover. Okay. Yes, but Paheli doesn't use that. Um, Ghost, thing. but it doesn't take the multiple ending uh, take the approach. Multiple ending. She gets back to the ghost. So yes, life, uh, yes. In Nagamandala, Girish Karnad resorts to three different endings. Okay. So she takes a snake lover, oblivious to the fact that uh, he is actually not her husband. She thinks because he assumes the form of her husband, and uh, so there is one ending where uh, the woman goes back to her uh, husband. Second ending. And the Naga lover, the cobra commits suicide, because he cannot bear to stay away from the woman he has loved. Third ending, she keeps the lover as well as her husband. It is uh, entirely up to the audience, what they want to go with. Okay, so, same structure in John Fowles, the French lieutenant's woman. Mm -hmm. What is it about? It is about, you know, a barbaric situation years back. Mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of uh, years back, uh, where the the princess falls in love with a commoner, okay. and the king uh, finds out, uh, you know, she is in love. So they, he wants to execute or you know prosecute him for the crime of uh, falling in love with the princess. Okay. So it's like the our uh, gladiator kind of uh, atmosphere where he's got two doors. Mm -hmm. He has to choose be between either of the doors. Okay. One has a, a, a you know a lion or a tiger which is going to hungry tiger going to pounce on him. Another one is a pretty lady. Yeah. So if the lady comes out, he can marry and settle with her. If the tiger comes out, he has to die. Yes. So he asked the princess, she would know inside hmm. the story, please tell me I want to live. So now her thought goes on. If yeah. I say which door the, the lady is, yes. uh, I can't bear to see him marry that girl and stay with him. Uh -huh. At the same time, I can't see him die uh, in front of my eyes. Okay. So all these thought processes, we as a reader, we, we, we read it. And then finally, she points out to a door. The story ends there. Okay, we don't so know we which don't door. know which one she's actually pointed out. Yes. So we have to take ourselves in the issue and decide whether. So what it's open to interpretation. Yeah. It, so there is no definite closure. To it. Right. Now coming to uh, Frederick Jameson, he also uses a term called an author becoming a bricolier. This is a term. Postmodernist art artists cannot invent new perspectives, that is Jameson's position. Instead, they operate as bricolliers, recycling previous works and styles. Are you with me on this? Again, we are talking about intertextuality, again, we are talking about past dish. Uh, we are also talking and that is again Frederick Jameson, erosion of uh, distinctions between high and low cultures. Now, um, Frederick Jameson gives a very good example of this movie called Body Heat, which was made sometime during uh, the 80s. Yes. Now, Body Heat uh, also draws from, it is a film noir, okay, it has a standard femme fatale and a besotted lover and a husband. Um, but uh, Body Heat also draws from an earlier text, Double Indemnity, hmm, uh, uh, which is a Billy Wilder movie and Postman Always Rings Twice.
Now, this movie which was made in uh, uh, during the 80s and this is a movie which was made sometime during the 50s. I am talking about the first Postman Rings twice, not the um, Jack Nicholson movie. Now, uh, um, uh, these are the first movie is set in a small town midwestern America and so is Body Heat. Now, um, uh, and in Body Heat, although it is set in contemporary times, but uh, much effort goes into recreating the small town environment, the ambience of Postman Always Rings Twice. Now, this according to Jameson is a very good example of, a, of an artist becoming a bricolier, setting a movie in the 80s, but is still trying to recreate the ambience, the atmosphere of um, the 50s, a small town uh, uh, of the 50s in America. And it, he draws on the audience's desire um, to return to their past, to evoke nostalgia through cinema. He also gives example of the Star War, the success of the stars, Star Wars series, the franchise. He says, because there was a time when Star Wars was a TV series okay, and it would be played, uh, it would be on air on television every Sunday okay. and perhaps there is a generation uh, of audience um, who, who remember this and you know it brings back all the nostalgic memories. So, when the success of these Star Wars franchise, the films is largely because uh, its ability, their ability to evoke the nostalgia, the nostalgic memories of the uh, bygone period. But then Jameson has also been criticized here. Uh, especially by the feminist uh, critics, who say that this desire to recreate the past uh, is not just because people want to look at the small town America all over again, but because it also, it was also the period where the gender distinctions were very clearly marked. Okay, women are supposed to be like this and men are supposed to be like this. Okay. So, uh, Jameson has been question or interrog interrogated or criticized, because uh, it's, more, it's not necessarily the small time ruler, rural ambience, but also because there is a definite, very well defined stable gender roles there, which appeal to this audience. Okay. Now, uh, I would also like you to, I am sure you have, both of you are familiar with a, a movie called Face Off. John Woo's face off. Now, uh, can you recall how face off begins? Face off itself is a very good example of a, uh, a Hollywood commodity. We were talking about market forces and uh, uh, art as commodity. So, John Woo, a very successful Chinese author, how he is welcome in a, a very standard Hollywood studio system and he makes fi a film with two big Hollywood stars. Okay. Now, face off, what happens in it? The title is also very interesting, face off. Yeah, the very opening sequence, can you tell me? Does anyone remember? What happens? The opening scene. What? Travolta is having a tiff with his daughter or something. Okay. Uh, you have uh, John Travolta, Sean Archer, if I remember correctly, that is his name in the movie. You have his antagonist, Nicholas Cage, Castor Troy. An unmitigated evil person. And Sean Archer is a typical good, do good hero, you know, goody two shoes kind of a hero. Uh, and he, you know, that distinction, the binaries are also brought about by the way they live, okay, where they live. Uh, uh, Castor's uh, abode is a virtual hell, you know, with re plenty of red, gold, and rock music playing in the background. Whereas Sean Archer lives in a typical, uh, yes, suburbs, yeah, very 
conform is very standardized kind of a very neat clean um, and an ideal idyllic kind of a peppermint houses, peppermint houses yes. So, um, he has a, a devoted dutiful wife and he has two children uh, a boy and a teenage girl uh, the boy is five or six. Now, the opening shot is very interesting and that is what uh, critics like Jameson and other uh, film theoreticians have tried to draw our attention to. It begins with a scene where Travolta is uh, um, uh, sitting on a merry go round okay, along with his son and the entire scene is shot um, in those uh, sepia tones, you know what are sepia tones and also a slow motion. And this is the scene where uh, Castor Troy, who is the antagonist, he comes and tries to kill uh, uh, Sean Archer, but ends up killing the child. Hmm. And if people who are familiar with this opening shot, they are reminded of a Hitchcock movie, Strangers on a Train. So, it is a total Uh, you know, um, not exactly a lift, okay, but uh, a homage to Hitchcock. Okay, so, it is a good example of the artist being a bricolier, taking some part from a known, very known uh, work of art, a known text by a great master like Hitchcock. Because strangers on a train, uh, the climax takes place between the hero and the villain. Bond. Yes. Can be called as uh, artist in Brakovic. Uh, is any scene referred to or quoted in such a way? That is the question. Well, he has taken the narrative. Yeah, the structure. The structure is. Yeah. But then, if you uh, here we are talking about artists being a bricolier when they quote or refer to scenes directly. Okay. Now uh, there is also very good example of um, pastish. We were talking about pastish you know a blend of high and low culture. When um, uh, Nicholas Cage is first introduced, he we you know we hear the strains of very popular rock music. Rock is definitely not high bro, okay. but at the same time uh, somewhere during the movie Nicholas character is in a church and where, where you hear hallelujah and that too by you know in a done in a very classical style. Okay. So, you know the standard classical western music. So, a blend of high and low and a very consciously done uh, work. So, the, as we were talking about in Pulp Fiction, how John Travolta's character is uh, referred to, quoted from his persona in Saturday Night Fever. Okay. So, likewise here, so very consciously referring to, uh, you know, to the uh, elements of pop as well as high culture. Any questions at this point? I am just giving you this example, so that you know you can use it when you apply your theories to a uh, to actual to an actual work of art. Yeah. So in literature or in film. Okay. So these are the things to look at. These are the things to locate. So, some more uh, apart from Tarantino, you have good examples of filmmakers like David Fincher. the uh, director of films like Zodiac and Fight Club, okay. that uh, seven, seven is a very good example of a postmodern text. David Lynch, and uh, um, Catherine Bigelow. The director of um, Hurt Locker. David Lynch uh, for 
blue velvet. So, these are some uh, of the where you know Sam Mendes, yeah, Sam, American Beauty is a good example of a yeah. All right then, thank you very much.